The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning or good afternoon and welcome to the Geological Society of America's uh. webinar, Optimizing Your Opportunities, How to Successfully Apply to GSA's Student Programs. My name is Talia Bear, and I am GSA's Career and Diversity Officer, and I will be moderating and presenting in today's webinar. Uh, your presenters today will be GSA staff, including myself, Matt Dawson, Education Manager, and Jennifer Nocerino, Program Officer for Mentor Programs and Short Courses. Before we get started, I'd like to go over a few items so you know how to participate in today's event. Everyone has joined the webinar on mute, and you'll see at the top right-hand corner of your screen a control panel. This control panel will be used to ask questions during the webinar by typing them into the questions box. We will address questions at the end of the webinar during a Q&A period, but please feel free to type in questions at any point during the webinar. The webinar will be approximately one hour in length and is being recorded for later on-demand viewing. An email with the play playback link will be sent to you in a few days. Uh, we can also send the PowerPoint slides to you uh, in that email. If you have any technical issues, um, you can try to log out and then log back in. Um, or send me a message through the chat box. At the end of the webinar, there will be a short survey. Please take a moment and fill it out. Your input is very important for the presenters in tailoring future webinars. So with that, why don't we go ahead and get started? <clears throat> we wanted to give you a short intro of our presenters today. Um, as I said, I'm Talia Bear, and I'm the Diversity and Career Officer. I manage the programs that we will discuss today, such as the Onto the Future Travel Award Program and the Northeast Urban Metro Travel Award. Um, I also run Geo Careers um, programs at the GSA annual meeting. Um, I have a background in anthropology and a master's in education and human development. I've worked mostly in informal education and outreach um, STEM organizations with a variety of groups, including K through 12 teachers, youth, and currently in higher education. I will move on to the next presenter and she can introduce herself. And my name's Jennifer Nocerino and I oversee GSA's mentor, short course, and field award programs. Uh, for this presentation, we have a Field Camp Scholarship Award, and I'll be talking about that in particular here. I have a BA and two MAs. Um, I worked for, I've been with GSA about 12 years now, and prior to that, I worked for AGU for uh, five and a half, six years. So multiple times I started to go for my PhD and stopped and then got jobs with the nonprofits and found out that I absolutely love working in nonprofits. So sometimes you might think your career should take a certain path, but you might find that naturally you really just fit better somewhere else. So um, I've been here a while and I love what I do. And our last presenter is Matt. And we'll forward on to the next slide for Matt to review. Thanks very much, Jen. So I am Matt Dawson. I am the GSA Education Programs Manager. I've been with the Geological Society of America since 2010, so uh, just a little over seven years now. Um, and as Education Programs Manager, I oversee a number of different programs uh, like GeoCore America, the Geoscientists in the Parks program and the Student Research Grants programs. Those are the ones that we will be focusing on later on in this presentation. Um, I am also involved with our EarthCache program, which is an educational form of geocaching. And I also work on our K through 12 teacher programs. So if any of you are thinking at some point of, of getting involved in, in teaching, in the teaching profession, um, I, I would love to hear from you later on. 
Um, my background is in geology. I've got a bachelor's from Caltech and a master's from MIT. And um, I learned early on that my interests lot, you know, lied in the education arena. So I taught high school earth science for about six years in Massachusetts and then worked as an environmental educator in Arizona for a few years. And then that's where I encountered GSA and I got involved as a participant in the GeoCore America program. That was when I became a GSA member and learned more about the society. And shortly afterward, I, I responded to a job announcement to work at GSA headquarters running the GeoCore program. So that's how I got here and followed a similar path to Jen and Talia, starting in the sciences and then moving into the education and nonprofit sector. Thank you, Matt and Jennifer. So I'm going to just talk a little bit about um, the Geological Society of America, just for a few slides, um, in case you're unfamiliar with um, the society. So um, GSA is a professional society made up of a little over 25,000 geoscientists worldwide. Um, our membership is about 34% students um, and the rest professionals who are working in academia, education, industry, and government. Our mission is to advance geoscience research and discovery, service to society, stewardship of the earth, and the geosciences prof profession. And we do this by serving our membership through the publication of academic journals, such as Geology and Lithosphere, Bulletin and Geosphere. Um, GSA also hosts scientific meetings, um, both through our regional sections within the US um, we have a national annual meeting held every year, and then also international and special meetings throughout the year. GSA also provides education and outreach activities, which are the uh, many of the student opportunities um, that we will present today and that help um, students through their academic and professional advancement in the geosciences. GSA also works on public policy and government affairs through our congressional office in Washington, D.C. that advocates on behalf of the geosciences. Um, and GSA also provides awards and honors in recognition of its members. Um, so like all professional societies, GSA's work is driven by and from its membership. So GSA is your society um, and you let us know what services um, and activities that best serve you. If we look at GSA's structure, it would look something like this slide um, where we have GSA's membership um, of 25,000 plus members. Um, from that membership, GSA is guided by um, our council and council is made up of volunteers who are elected from GSA's membership and represent the membership and steer and guide the organization and staff. Um, GSA's membership is also made up of other groups, including regional sections and disciplinary divisions um, and committees. And these groups help guide the organization and provide advice on specific issues. Uh, GSA also has associated societies and partners um, that we work on for with specific issues on specific issues. So there are several ways as a student to get involved as a student and as a member to get involved in GSA. And one of those is through the GSA's um, disciplinary divisions. These are scientific disciplines um, within the society. Um, and so we have 18 specialty divisions and they make up the backbone of GSA's technical programs at the scientific meetings. Um, and getting involved in a GSA division is great because um, many of them publish their own newsletters um, and they provide resources on careers and leadership and service. And it's also a great way to network within your specific um, division. And so as a member of GSA, you are provided with um, a choice of belonging to one division or one section along with your membership. Um, as I mentioned before, GSA also has committees and these uh, provide specific advice to council um, on specific issues. Um, and with most committees, there is a student representative um, and those uh, 
positions are either through a self-nomination process or a nomination process. Um, and students are placed on committees and to help shape and guide programs at GSA. Um, some of the committees, uh, for example, uh, will review student um, applications for some of the opportunities that we are going to discuss today um, and rank those students. Um, some of these committees will work on issues uh, regarding um, awards nominations. Um, so there really is a variety of different things and services that you can um, be involved in by being a student member on a committee. Um, volunteering on a committee is a really smart way to gain leadership and service experience that you can put onto your resume or CV and is also a great way to expand your network and interact with some of the leadership um, at GSA. So if you have lots of creative ideas um, on how you'd like your society to operate, you might be a good candidate for a committee. GSA also has student opportunities through our Student Advisory Council. Um, and the Student Advisory Council is made up of student members from GSA's division sections and committees. And the purpose is to be a resource to the leadership on the needs of student members. Um, and to become involved in the Student Advisory Council, um, simply be involved within your division section or committee um, and ask uh, the chair if you can be um, a part of the Student Advisory Committee. Okay, so uh, next, uh, this is Jennifer, thanks Talia. We'll talk about student opportunities specifically within GSA and just a little bit more of an overview and then we'll go into some of the specific programs. So GSA does have affordable access to publications and research online. We do have an opportunity for you to develop skills in presenting your scientific research at our meetings. We offer funding for your research and field work and also a variety of career building resources. And it's not advancing. Talia, would you advance to the next slide for me? Thank you. Uh, publications, we've got these journals that you see here are free online for our student members. And the next slide, please. We also offer GSA Today and GSA Connection. These are both monthly publications and all members, including students, receive these. And the next slide. Uh, as far as meetings go, Talia mentioned we have an annual meeting and sectional meetings. Our annual meeting is held uh, in October or November in the fall of each year. And we strive to bring as many students as we can to our meetings. So for both the annual and the sectional meetings, we offer travel grants, a variety of volunteer opportunities where you can work 10 hours and then get a free registration. Once you get to the meeting, annual or sectional, we offer a variety of student programming, including networking, career, and mentor programs, many of which have free food. So we can help cover your costs that way as well. At our annual meeting, we also offer short courses for students, and those are often taught by industry reps, and it's a really great way to network because a lot of times they come teach these courses in a way to meet students and network and possibly hire them on as interns. So it's a great way to network and get seen. At our section meetings, on the next slide, we have uh, six of those that are held in the spring, March through May, roughly. They're throughout North America. Our section meetings are quite a bit smaller than our annual meeting. The annual meeting is six to 8,000. The section meetings are just a couple hundred. So it's a lot easier for students. There's a smaller group. It's not as overwhelming. There's a high percent of students at the section meetings as well. They're held a lot closer to you, so they're easier to get to. They're more affordable. They are a great place to present your research. So if you're looking to do a poster or a presentation at a meeting, this is a really great way to start. 
Uh, we do have a variety of mentor programs and career workshops you can attend there and field trips as well. And as I said, there are travel grants and uh, opportunities to volunteer to get free registration to attend those to help make them very affordable for you. And the uh, next slide. So we do offer, as I said, a variety of career building programs. These ones that you see bulleted are all the ones we're going to talk about now. And I will discuss the field camp scholarships, which is one of the programs I oversee. So as you all know, as a geology student, most universities are going to require that you attend field camp, generally a six week long uh, field camp summer, uh, summer program where you're out in the field. These field camps can run an average of five to six thousand dollars. That's the cost of the course, but also for six weeks you're not able to work. So your rent and your bills and everything is still due. So that's figured into that amount. Because that amount is so high, you can look at various organizations to try to offset your costs. And on the next slide, you'll see that we offer scholarships that are two thousand dollars each to students. You can go to any field camp you like. Uh, the year you apply, it does have to be that summer that you go into the field. The scholarships are based on diversity, economic need, and merit. And the merit component is essentially your grades, your GPA. And if we move on to the next slide. So your application for this program consists of an online resume, which is not actually your resume, but it's quite similar. We ask you to put in uh, the universities you've attended and um, your former employers, courses that apply to the program, and grades as well. We ask for two letters of recommendation and a cover letter. We do have a committee that reviews these and makes the selections, and they read everything and score everything. So they'll score all your online info, your letters of recommendation and your cover letter, and then based on those scores, that's how we make the determination. And the next slide, um, you'll notice the field camp scholarships are accepted in early February through mid-March. So for next summer, for 18, it would that would start in early February of 18 through mid-March of 18, and we try to let folks know by the end of April whether or not they've received the scholarship. So you might definitely look for those this year coming up. And I believe that's my last slide. And after that, we move on to our next program. OK, so I'm going to talk about On to the Future. On to the Future is a travel award program. Um, for undergraduate, graduate students, recent graduates. And what it is is partial funding for students who have never attended a GSA annual meeting before. Um, if you've attended a section meeting of GSAs, um, you're still eligible for, for On to the Future, or OTF as we call it. Um, On to the Future targets students who are diverse and underrepresented in the geosciences. Um, this includes students with disabilities, LBGTQ, non-traditional, first generation, meaning they've been the first um, in their families to attend college, women, minorities, and other groups. It's really a uh, very inclusive um, group of, of students that get funded each year. Um, we fund about 75 per year, and you can see that the average award has been about $500 um, since 2013, but it really ranges depending on the location of the student and the location of the meeting and can be um, you know, up to $1,000 uh, for an award. So our application opens March 1st, and it stays open until the last Friday in May, which I believe is the 25th this year, or next year in 2018. Um, so as in, on, if you are funded through the On to the Future program, um, you get to, um, you get partial funding to attend the meeting, full meeting registration, uh, one year membership to the organization, and we set you up with a mentor um, at the meeting that helps you navigate, um, choose sessions, you can ask them career academic advice. Um, many times um, it's great to have someone to connect with at the meeting. There's 7,000 plus attendees, <laughs> so it's easy to get lost. Um, and so it's nice to have someone to connect with um, through your mentor 
And some of the mentors um, can be either mature professionals or um, more near peer mentors, such as pass on to the future students. Um, at the meeting, we also offer morning sessions. And um, in those sessions, we bring in GSA leadership um, to meet with the students and to talk about GSA's governance and structure. Um, and then we end the uh, four days with a reception for students and uh, student alumni. So our application is one letter of recommendation um, and then answering four different application questions that relate to your professional and academic goals, any hardships you've faced, and describing how attending the meeting will enhance your professional and academic goals. Um, and then we also ask for a budget as well. So another travel award that we have, which is opening, um, the application opens on Friday, is the Northeast Urban Travel Award Program. And this is actually um, a program for students who want to attend the Northeast Section Meeting, which this year the Northeast Section Meeting will be in Burlington, Vermont, uh, March 18th through 20th. And so that application is open until February 23rd. And this is very generous, full funding um, to attend the Northeast Section Meeting. Um, funding includes um, your travel, your accommodation, your food, um, and dependent care, and also um, any field trip costs or short courses or receptions that have an additional cost to them that you may want to attend while you're at the Northeast Section Meeting. Um, this travel award is limited to students who are non-traditional, and by that, um, it's defined by the National Center for Education Statistics as a student who has delayed post-secondary education by a year or more, um, maybe who attends part-time and works part-time, a student who works full-time, or a student who has uh, family constraints such as dependents, um, um, children uh, that they're caring for. So um, this, uh, the requirement applications, the application requirement for this program is three application questions explaining your academic and professional goals, why you want to attend the meeting, um, and how it will help you reach your goals, and then any challenges that you've faced in attending um, professional meetings. We also require one letter of recommendation, um, and we also require a very detailed um, budget. As I said, this is um, full funding, and so the budget needs to be uh, pretty precise. We also have other travel award options, which Jennifer mentioned, um, which are to GSA's annual meeting. Um, and so if you do not qualify for the On to the Future or the Northeast section meeting, um, GSA's regional sections provide small travel grants to students. And um, there are six regional sections and all of the eligibility requirements are different. So you'd have to check online um, what those might be. Um, typically they're for undergraduate students and typically the student has to be presenting research. Um, so you can check closer to the annual meeting for those. GSA also offers travel awards to its section meetings. Um, again, varying requirements. So you'd have to check on the details of your particular section for that. We also offer a uh, volunteer, if you'd like to be a student volunteer at meetings, and that will get you a free meeting registration. At GSA's annual meeting, you have to volunteer 10 hours um, to get full meeting registration. And at section meetings, you have to volunteer seven hours. Um, and a lot of times being a student volunteer is great because you get to um, sit in a session and also uh, network with other students who are volunteering and also the the professionals that are at the event that you're volunteering at. I'm going to turn it over to Matt to talk about GeoCore. Thank you. Thank you very much, Talia. All right, so this is the program that, that drew me to the Geological Society of America in the first place. This is GeoCore America, which provides paid short-term geoscience opportunities in some of the most amazing areas in the United States and the world, really. Uh, and these are locations that are managed by federal agencies. Currently, our two primary partners are the U.S. Bureau of Land Management 
and the U.S. Forest Service. Uh, the, the BLM is part of the Department of Interior, and the Forest Service is part of the U.S. Department of Agriculture. And the projects um, relate to any aspect of the geosciences. Um, and actually pictured here is Emily, um, who worked at the Hiawatha National Forest in Michigan back in 2015. And she worked um, on a cave and karst inventory. So she spent a lot of time out in the field uh, monitoring and taking stock of different karst and cave features within the Hiawatha National Forest. Um, and that's an ongoing project that takes place over many years. And she spent a summer of uh, 12 weeks contributing to that. 12 weeks is a typical term for these projects. Sometimes they can go up to as much as 30, 40, or even 52 weeks. Uh, we have a maximum term of up to one year. Um, and participants are paid. The pay starts at $10.35 an hour. In some cases, the pay is a little bit higher depending on the needs of the position. Um, if they need a higher level of skills and expertise, it may offer a higher pay rate. Um, or if it's, in, if it's in an area with a high cost of living, the pay rate may be increased as well. So there are some locations that pay as much as $12, $13, $15 dollars an hour. It kind of tops out around the $15 per hour mark. Um, and the pay isn't very high, but, but you do get excellent experiences uh, working in the field, in the lab, uh, GIS work on the computer, uh, training and mentorship by federal employees, and also you get to live and work in just some amazing areas. Um, we had people working on glaciers uh, up in Montana this summer. People work on in cave sites out in the Tongass National Forest in Alaska. That's a very remote area. Um, and there are also positions in the eastern United States with like the Alabama National Forest, the Green Mountain National Forest in Vermont, and the, the White Mountain National Forest in New Hampshire. So these opportunities really do take place nationwide. Um, in addition to, to the pay and the mentorship and the overall experience, uh, participants can qualify for, for PLC hiring eligibility. And what that means is, is public land core hiring. And that's not for every position in GeoCore, but at least half, maybe more of them, do qualify the participants for this, which means that it gives you a little bit of an edge over other candidates when you are applying for certain types of federal jobs. It's kind of a complicated process and it's one that we help steer people through, um, but some positions do qualify for that special hiring eligibility. Um, so if you're interested in a career with a federal agency, um, this is a really great program to consider. We will soon be posting positions on on and shortly after the 1st of December this year. And positions will be posted in, in an initial wave, and then some additional positions will come online after that. And we have a two-month window during which you can apply. And the deadline for that is February 2nd, 2018. In the past, if you've applied to this program, um, the, the general rule was we did not start reviewing applications until after that deadline. That is going to change a little bit this year and applications will be reviewed on a rolling basis. And, and I'll address that a little bit, a little bit more later on. Um, so that is the GeoCore America program. And next we'll go into the National Park Service Geoscientists in the Parks program. Um, pictured here, we've got Ben O2 and Nicole Ridgewell. They had a, had a really interesting position out at Dinosaur National Monument in Utah a couple of years back. And it's a position that, that has had the project carried on in recent years. And I have a link in here um, to the CarnegieQuarry.com where you can see the results of the project they worked on and that was carried on by more recent participants where they essentially created a digitized version of the dinosaur quarry wall that is, that is visible in the visitor center at Dinosaur National Monument. And that's a National Park Service site. So the Geoscientists in the Parks program is very similar to the GeoCore America program that I described on the previous slide, um, except here it, it is a partnership with just one agency, that's the National Park Service. So again, these are paid and short-term opportunities anywhere from three months up to one year in length. Um, geoscience is the focus, so it could be caves and karst, um, glacial monitoring, uh, volcanic monitoring, hydrogeology, geomorphology, soil science, anything related to the geosciences. But there are a few positions in other subjects as well, like ecology, 
wildlife biology, herbology. So those are the minority of positions, um, but most are within the geosciences. And here the pay is different. It's, it's a little bit lower of a pay rate. It's $7.50 per hour, but participants can qualify for an AmeriCorps Education Award. And if you do a three month um, term, which is kind of the standard minimum, you can qualify for a, a, a award that's a little bit over $1,500 and the amount goes up from there if you complete, complete more weeks. Um, another benefit is, again, public land core hiring eligibility. And that applies to any position within the GIP program. Uh, you can then apply for federal jobs through usajobs.gov using the public land core hiring ability. And then I also mentioned here there, the, there's a DHA hiring, which is the direct hire authority. And that's a small subset of positions in GIP where if you successfully, successfully complete 11 weeks, you can then be directly hired by the National Park Service without having to actually compete for the position with the other general pool of candidates. So that's a really powerful tool if you're interested in getting a job in a federal agency. So similar to the GeoCorps program, we'll be posting positions around the 1st of December. So that's coming up in just a few days. We think we'll have somewhere between 90 and 100 opportunities available through the GIP program. And like GeoCorps, the application deadline is the 2nd of February. Uh, and again, applications will start being reviewed on a rolling basis sometime in early January. So we'll pay to apply on the early side of things. Um, so that's the GIP program and I'll just mentioned these positions also occur all across the country, um, east to west, positions in Denali National Park in Alaska, Death Valley National Park in California, Big Bend in Texas. Uh, we've had people in Florida, um, Michigan, all over the country, um, large parks like the Grand Canyon, down to, to smaller parks like, like Great Sand Dunes in Colorado. Um, so that's kind of an introduction to the GIP program. And then next, I will start going into some of the tips on how to apply to these programs. Oh, wait, I'm getting ahead of myself. Next, it's research grants. So um, another program that I run at GSA, the Graduate Student Research Grants. Pictured here is a recent grant recipient, Ethan Shavers. He was doing research um, for his PhD at St. Louis University. He was doing work in the Avon Volcanic District in Southeast Missouri. And it was a combination of remote sensing and field work exploring diatremes. Um, so graduate student research grants at GSA are open to master's students and PhD students. So at, at both levels, you can apply. If you get a grant one time, you can apply again to receive a second grant. So if you get one for your master's, you can also get one for a PhD, or you can get two for a PhD or two for your master's, doesn't matter. But you're eligible to receive two during your graduate student career. Um, it's, it's only open to students at institutions in North and Central America, um, and the student does not need to originate from the, those areas. So a you know, student can be from China and attending school in Mexico and be eligible for one of these grants. So the key is where you're attending school. It's got to be in that geographic region. Any aspect of the geosciences are included, um, history of geoscience, geoscience education, um, energy, geology, geomorphology, volcanology, geochemistry, you name it, everything. It's a really, it's a really a broad net. And in 2017, we had a record of 785 students apply. That can seem pretty daunting, but the way we do it is we attempt to give grants to approximately 50% of all applicants. So last year, or I should say earlier this year, 395 students were awarded a grant. Um, there was a total of $692,000 were granted. Um, so the average grant worked out to just over $1,700. The maximum is usually around $2,500. There are some exceptions. There are a few special grants that get extra money from the GSA Foundation, and they sometimes go up to $3,000 or more. And the minimum grant was around five or $600. So we try to try to have the minimum go no lower than $500 because then we realize the money becomes less useful. Um, and the application timeline is similar to GeoCore and GIP. Uh, we start accepting applications later this week on the 1st of December, and the application deadline is the 1st of February in 2018. 
and you'll see announcements about this in the GSA Today publication, uh, the GSA Connection email um, email newsletter if you subscribe to that. Um, but this is a program that's been going on for decades at GSA. It's very well funded. It receives support from the National Science Foundation and from the GSA Foundation. Um, so if you are a current grad student, I definitely encourage you to consider applying for this in the coming months. So I think that wraps up the summary of the different programs and the eligibility and, and what they all have to offer. So next we will move in to some tips for how to apply successfully for these various programs. And I'll cover this for about 10 to 15 minutes. And then afterwards, you know, we'll wrap up about 10 minutes before the hour so that we can allow time for questions and answers. Um, and I, I hope you have some questions for us. Also, after each of these tips, I'll briefly pause to allow my colleagues Talia and Jen to add a little bit of additional perspective. You know, each of the, each of the programs we described here today has some different requirements, um, so we each have, have some different tips that we like to provide. Um, and that brings us to the first tip, which is to very carefully read through the requirements for each program. Some of them are, are quite similar. The On to the Future program, the Field Scholar programs, the GeoCore program and the Geoscientist in the Parks program, those are all based on a very similar application software. So they all have very similar requirements, but there are some differences between them. So you want to be careful with that. Um, your general profile with like your name and address, et cetera, that information actually does get shared between those different applications. But much of the rest of the of the the application and the questions and the information, it's going to be unique to each program. So, so for starters, really make sure you read through the requirements. Each of our program websites have some application tips on them, some guidelines and, and, and other information to help you along the way. And then the other piece of advice, the next one, is it's really advantageous to begin the process early and then to try to finish early. And here's why. Um, if you wait until really close to the application deadline to start the application, you might realize that some of the information you need to gather isn't readily available to you. And then you run the risk of not completing things in time for the deadline. Um, and for most programs, finishing early doesn't really give you an actual advantage. But the advantage you get is this. Um, you, you know you're done early. You have time to review your application, check it over. Um, if you realize at the last stage that something doesn't seem right or you have a question or you're a little confused about something, then that allows you some time to get in touch with Talia, Jen, and myself to get some assistance. Um, as you might imagine, if you wait until the last day or two before the deadline or the day of the deadline, we have a high volume of emails and phone calls, and, it, and it's going to be very difficult to address your question in time for the deadline. So I definitely recommend getting an early start. And this year for the GeoCore and the GIP programs, there will actually be an advantage to working on and finishing your application early. And part of the reason is because we've been getting a, a higher and higher volume of applications each year. Um, and the parks, the parks that we work with, the forests and BLM sites are finding that that they're getting more applications than they need and have decided that they think they can find really great candidates earlier in the process, which then helps them start earlier with the onboarding, background checks, et cetera. Um, so in order to facilitate that, we will start reviewing applications in early January and we'll start the interviews and, and acceptance process earlier than usual. So for GeoCore and GIP, there's definitely a benefit to finishing early and beginning early. And just want to pause for a moment there in case Talia or Jen have anything to add about these first couple of points. Yeah, I would just say that um, beginning early is always a great idea and pay particular attention to the application deadline because, uh, for example, the On to the Future Act um, deadline is at the end of May. And so if you're already completed with classes and you need a recommendation letter, you're going to have to start that and get that to a faculty member much earlier than the end of school in case your faculty member is in the field for the summer. So just begin sort of planning much earlier than the deadline. 
Thanks, Talia. That, that's a great point and leads very nicely into the next point here, which is that one of the first things you should do is make sure you submit a request for one or more recommendation letters from somebody who is very familiar with your work. Also, you know, very important is, is getting a letter from somebody who is going to be able to write something very positive about your work and experience, attitude, et cetera. So you want to make sure it's somebody who, who knows your work well, they're familiar with, with what you've done, what you're capable of doing, what your strengths are, and that they will be able to reflect that clearly and very positively in their letter. It's good to request these letters early because, like Talia mentioned, you might find that um, a certain professor, advisor, or boss, supervisor, um, the letters can be from any of those. Uh, they might be out in the field or on vacation or sabbatical. We get lots of out-of-office responses through our automated system um, when requests are sent for letters of recommendation. And those out-of-office responses come for various reasons. So you might find out that the person you really want the letter from is not going to be able to get it done on time. Um, so by doing that early on, you can then go to your, your second person in line. Um, also, it's a matter of courtesy. You know, the more time you allow them to write the letter, you know, that's that's just you know polite. But it also means that they're going to have more time to focus on writing you a really good letter. Um, you know, if you're asking them two days before the deadline, my guess is that the letter they write, they're they're going to have to put it together really quickly, and it might not be as positive and as strong and as detailed as it could have been had you give them four to six weeks to do that. So that's definitely one of the first steps that you should do within your application. So I recommend that I recommend logging in, setting up the basics of your application, and then quickly going in and requesting the recommendation letter. For some of our programs, you only need one recommendation letter. For others, you may need two. So again, check the requirements and make sure you're getting the right number of recommendations. If it says you only need one, you can still request two. Then you've got a backup person in case the first person doesn't isn't able to submit it on time. Um, and two letters is just better than one if you can do it. Um, and I did want to mention that for the research grants program, the letter is a little bit different. It's not really a traditional recommendation letter, but instead you have your research advisor write an appraisal assessing like the quality of your research project in, in, in terms of its concept and assessing your ability to successfully complete the research project independently, but with some guidance. So again, that's something you want to request very early on in the process. And, and then I'd yeah. like to make a couple comments as well, if you don't mind. Um, yes. When you um, request a recommendation that's done through our system, but I would highly recommend that you then go meet with and talk to that professor or individual as well. Um, you might sit down, give them a copy of your resume so they have some background information on you. Make sure they remember exactly who you are and what you've done and, and where you're headed and why this program is going to be useful to you. We occasionally receive recommendations that are extremely short because the professor or individual just doesn't have enough information. So the more information you can give them, the better. If possible, I would see if they can give you a copy of that recommendation or you'll notice it says request a positive recommendation. Ask if they can write a positive recommendation. If for some reason they can't, ask for feedback on why they can't. Or if you get a recommendation you're not happy with, maybe go talk to that professor and get some information. Um, if it turns out you are not awarded with one of the programs we've been discussing, you know, you can always contact that program officer to get an understanding of maybe why you were graded a little lower than others. And sometimes that might have to do with the recommendation. And perhaps then you might go back again for before you reapply, talk to those professors and really try to get a copy of those recommendations, look them over, maybe that you're going to the wrong folks. So the more you can interact with that recommender, the better. I just want to add one thing, which is um, once you request a recommendation letter, the onus is really on you to make sure that that faculty member or um, supervisor sends that letter in. Um, we as program officers, the automated system sends the, e um, the email to the uh, mentor, the faculty mentor to write that recommendation letter. 
but we don't send any reminders to them. So it's really up to you to contact the, the person and ask if they've turned it in yet, um, because we won't be doing any of the follow up on that. Thanks a lot, Talia and Jen. Yeah, the recommendation letters are, are very important. So you want to put, put a lot of effort into the follow up on those as well. Okay, well, the, the next piece I wanted to mention is, is be ready to write accurate and concise answers to the application questions. So again, this is where it's a good idea to, to get logged in and, and get set up early on so you can go in and see what the questions are because you might find that some of the questions are gonna take some thought on your part and you might wanna mull them over for a few days um, or you might wanna compose a response and then maybe have some other people look at it and provide feedback or you might write a response and then come back to it a few days later and decide that you've got some different ideas or you wanna modify it or do some editing to it. So it's good to look over the questions in advance so that you can come up with, with really good answers. And you wanna be detailed, provide as much information as you can, but, but try to keep it concise because then the, the heart of your information will come across more clearly um, you know, versus where if it's a really long response that's trying to make one kind of key point that point might get lost in the rest of the words and verbiage there. Um, you know, for example, we have a, a question that, that we consider a very important one. It asks how you, uh, if you were selected for one of our programs, how you might add to the diversity of that program, because that's, that's a key part of GSA's mission. We have questions um, that are sort of like a cover letter where you're gonna talk a little bit about your motivation, why you wanna be involved in this program, you know, where your interests in geology lie. Um, you know, what's, what's, you know, making you want to work for a federal agency, for example, what's the motivation behind your research proposal, et cetera. So, so you want to look at those questions early on and try to come up with, with really, really good answers. Um, and each of your answers in our application system is limited in terms of how many, how many characters you can enter. And this is a part that confuses a lot of people. It's not, it's not the number of words because that's kind of harder for our system to count. It's based on the number of characters, you know, letters, numbers. It also includes spaces. So in the system, you'll see there's a little counter that tells you how many characters you have left. So just be mindful of that. That is something to look at before you start composing your responses because you want to make sure that they can fit within that, within that character limit. Natalia or Jen, do either of you have, have anything to add to that point? No. No, thanks. All right, and, and there are a lot of different questions. The questions do differ based on the program that you are applying to, so, so make sure you review what those are all going to be. All right, then now on to the next point. Um, again, this comes back once more to, to why it's good to start early. Um, for most of our programs, not all of them, but for most, you will need to enter a record of your grades. In the past, we used to have people submit transcripts um, but because transcripts are in such different formats um, between different universities, a lot of them have you know, private information on them, like birth dates, social security numbers, um, they became difficult to manage. So we have a system where you just manually enter all of your grades. It's a little bit time consuming, we understand. However, that record of your grades does get shared between the Onto the Future program, the field scholarship programs, and the GeoCore and GIP programs. So if you enter it once for one of those programs, it stays in our system and carries over to the other programs. And if you apply for something again the following year, your grades will remain in the system and then you can add new grades to it. Um, so again, it, it's kind of time consuming to set it up, but once you have it, have it in there, it stays in there and follows your application from program to program. And we do not require grades for the research grants applications. And for the grades, you do want to focus on the relevant courses. So, you know, if you had like a racquetball course in phys ed, that's not relevant for any of our programs. So you wouldn't need to enter that grade, obviously. But if you took a canoeing course as a phys ed class, that might be relevant to some of our um, field-based programs. So it may be worth entering it. If you have some writing or literature courses for some of our programs, that might not be relevant. But if you're applying for, say, a GeoCore position that involves um, writing of a technical nature, writing about geology on a website that the public will read, 
then I think it would be a good idea to include a writing course in there. Um, so we don't need to see every course and every grade. Um, we do want to see the ones that are most relevant to the program to which you are applying. Um, so if, for example, if you're applying to the On to the Future program and you've taken some courses related to you know, diversity or various cultures, um, that might be something worth including as well um, because that fits with the goals of the program. Uh, but for OTF, the grades are not weighted as heavily as they are for some of the other programs, but you still can enter them. Um, so, so this is a case where you might need to go online and download a transcript like from your university um, or request one through the registrar's office, whatever, whatever process that you use at your institution. So, so get yourself your grade record and be ready to enter those online. Any comments on that from Talia or Jen? No, I'm just doing a time check here. We have about 10 minutes left. Yeah. All right, I will try to roll through these remaining pieces quickly. Thank you, Talia. Um, okay, then for some of the programs, such as the travel grants, uh, onto the future and also the research grant program, you do need to produce a budget. And that budget has to be realistic, detailed, and you have to justify it and explain the rationale behind the different the different costs that you're requesting reimbursement for or you're reimbursing you're requesting funds for. Um, so again, here it's a case where more detail is better. And this might be an area where you can get some input from, from an advisor or a mentor as well. And you know, check out the pro program guidelines for what are acceptable and non-acceptable budget items. Um, that's especially true, I know, in the research grant program where, for example, you cannot request money for tuition costs or salary costs, um, but you can request money for travel and lab costs. Um, so make sure that the details that are in your budget align well with what the program will allow and break it all down in terms of the different dollar amounts for each of the different items. And then finally, when you are all done, again, a lot of this ties back um, to finishing up early, you know, allow yourself time to review the application, maybe walk away from it for a few days, then come back to it, proofread, make some edits, you maybe have a peer or a mentor look it over for you and see if they have any input, especially in things like the cover letter, you know, where you're talking about your, your motivation and your interest in the program, why you're applying. Um, that's kind of a, a longer response, a longer answer. So it could very well be worth um, having some additional eyes review that for you. And I think now we will move to the next slide, which talks a bit about what to expect after you apply. All right, and again, I will I will we'll go through these quickly um, so that we have some time for questions and answers still. Um, so not all the programs will send an automatic confirmation email. What happens is is once you you know click that you're done and you're saving your application, uh, what happens is once the application deadline comes, we then close our system down, and every application that that every application that was completed then moves to the next stage where it is reviewed by whatever committee is involved with that particular program. And the review does not begin instantaneously. So if the deadline is February 1 or February 2, it might be you know, February 15th, February 20th when the review process actually starts. And that's because our IT department and we as program officers take a little bit of time to process the applications, sort them, and organize them before we pass them to the review committees. And then the review committees take those in and then they usually need a little bit of time to get things sorted on their end before they can start their review. And as I mentioned earlier, GeoCore and GIP will have rolling acceptance timelines this year, starting in early January. So it does pay off to have your application done by then and get those recommendation letters in early. Um, after the review process has gotten underway from at, at that two to three week point, um, that's a good time to contact Talia, Jen, or myself as the program officers if you have some questions about your application status and what the other steps are going to be coming after that. Um, if you are not selected for an award or a position or a grant, you will be notified. So we, we won't just leave you hanging. However, we usually, you know, for some of the programs, we will wait until all the other awards are confirmed before we let people know that they were not selected. 
and so that process does take a little bit of time. Um, there are sometimes a wait list or a list of alternates, and if you are put on one of those lists, you will be notified. And then if an opportunity comes up where we can move you, move you from the wait or alternate list onto the awardee list, we will notify you via email. And then, you know, the last few pieces of advice I've got here is that if you are selected into the program, you know, you know, study it in advance, be prepared to make the most of it, talk with your program officers to get some advice on, on how to approach it, how to prep for it, and, and let others know about it. Um, let colleagues at your university know, let your professors know. I think it's really great when like a university website will write a, a news story about, about a student, you know, winning a grant or a travel award or one of our field scholarships. It, it's a great way to kind of show off your success, but then also let others know about these opportunities that are out there. You can also write for GSA's blog and, and talk about your experience there. We'd love to see that. And if you're not selected, I strongly recommend you consider reapplying. Um, you know, you can reuse elements of your prior application. You can build from that experience, get some feedback on what can be improved, and, and go for it again. And I know I've seen people apply three or four times for a program before they got accepted into it. Um, so it really pays off to be persistent and stick with it. And that is the last piece here, unless Jen or Talia have anything to add. And then I think we'll start to move into the Q&A and we'll put up our contact information here momentarily as well. Yes, so if we have any questions, please type them into the questions box. I see we have some here. Both Matt and I have been trying to answer them um, by typing in an answer to some of the ones that are a bit easier um, to answer. So uh, one of the questions here is, um, are there undergraduate research grants? Yes, and, and I can answer that if you'd like, Talia. Go ahead. Yes, uh, the answer is yes, there are undergraduate research grants. There are definitely fewer of those than there are for, for graduate students. There are, like I mentioned, 395 grad students got grants last year. My guess is that at the undergrad level, it's on the order of 20 to 50. That's kind of a guess. But the undergraduate grants are generally awarded by the GSA sections. So if you go to the GSA grants page, which is geosociety.org slash grants, there is a link down on the page for undergraduate grants. And I believe that will take you out to a list of the different sections. And those are ge the geographic regions that we referred to earlier in this presentation. But a number of the sections, not all of them, um, maybe four to five of the sections do offer undergraduate grants. They each have their own application process um, and timeline. So you have to check with the individual sections. They do vary a bit. They're not really very standardized. Um, and some of them you email in an application, others you mail one in. Um, so it really varies, but I tell you what, not many people are applying to those. That They're not as well known as the graduate grants. So I definitely encourage people to apply. You can get a few hundred dollars, a thousand dollars. And it's also a really good experience to get those larger grants when you're a graduate student. So yes, that's, that's my short answer for that question. That's a really good question. Um, we have a question about uh, what type of postdoctoral opportunities does GSA offer? Jennifer, do you want to answer that one? I would say that for postdoctoral opportunities, um, you would primarily consider going to our meetings. There's quite a bit of networking that takes place at our meetings, as well as career programs on site where we match students along with um, recruiters and or mentors from various companies, representatives who are there. So it's a great place to network and get your foot in the door. Um, otherwise, a lot of our programs are set up where um, you can apply when you're a student and the first year after you've graduated. Uh, GEACOR, I know, does have opportunities for folks all the way through their career, and Matt might want to address that. Um, that goes all the way up into um, folks who are retired at this point and have already had a career. So, Matt, do you have postdocs applying to GEACOR? Yes, definitely. Um, GEOCOR and GIP have no requirements that somebody be a student. Um, so, yeah, you could be a, a postdoctoral researcher and certainly apply for both GEOCOR and GIP. Yeah, definitely. Okay. 
And I also wanted to mention that there are a few GSA awards that are open to, to postdocs. And those are generally offered by divisions, I believe. So what you'd want to do is look into the GSA division or divisions that are most closely related to your research and check out their award lists and see if there's an award or a grant that might be appropriate for you. Um, there is also the Cole Awards, and one or both of those are open to postdocs. Uh, and those are in Invertebrate Micropaleontology, that's for the Stores Cole Award, and the Gladys Cole Award is for uh, Geomorphology and Arid Terrains. But those are some that, that would be worth looking into. So I just want to address this one um, question really quickly, if we can, because I see it's already um, been one hour. But uh, do, do the question is, do student does a student need to be a member to apply for most of the opportunities we've talked with today? Um, and I would say that the answer is yes and no. Um, you'd have to check the eligibility of each particular program. For example, the Onto the Future Travel Awards, you do not need to be a member of GSA to apply for that. In fact, you get a one year free membership um, as a part of that program. Jennifer or Matt, do you want to add anything? I, I, I wanted to add that, yeah, that, that's a really good question. For the graduate student research grants, it definitely requires a GSA membership. But for the GeoCore America program and the Geoscientists in the Parks program, neither of those require GSA membership. Of course, we encourage you to become a GSA member because that gives you lots of other benefits as well. Um, but it's not required for those two programs. Just like Talia mentioned, it's not required for OTF. All right. Well, thank you. That concludes this webinar. So thank you so much for joining us. We look forward to any questions you might have and hope you will apply to one or more of our programs. Um, if you do have questions, um, you can see our email addresses up on the screen. Please contact us. Um, we will still have a short survey after we close and we'd appreciate any feedback that you have. So thank you very much and goodbye.